So, uh, hello everyone. I am Yoshi uh, from University of Michigan. I will present our paper with Kentaro, uh, Bottlenecks of ICT Innovation in Rwanda. First, I would like to give some background of Rwanda. Rwanda is a small country that is located in the center of Africa. As many of you may know, after the genocide in 1994, Rwanda has a strong policy to promote ICT-based country development. For example, Rwanda has distributed 280,000 laptops and a wide range of optical fiber cable network. Okay. This 500 Rwanda front note is a good evidence of the country's priority on ICT. Laptop is printed. Business-related indicators also show Rwanda doing well. Ease of doing business, good public safety, and low corruption, all of them are ranked uh, second in Africa. On the other hand, there are challenges too. For example, uh, the Human Development Index by UNDP and ICT Readiness by ITU rank Rwanda as the lowest 20% in the world. So, given this gap between aspirations and reality, our research question is, what are the strengths, weaknesses, and the potential lessons of the ICT and innovation sectors in Rwanda? Two broad classes of related work are relevant. One is how ICT sector develop, development happened in general. The literature discusses ICT sector development model, brain circulation, which is a phenomenon that talented citizens who live for abroad return years later to accelerate economic growth. And the city comparates ingredients of success, such as research universities and investment with capital. And India's ICT sector as a successful example. The right side, uh, the second area is innovation ecosystem in Africa. Previous work examined that uh, countries are increasingly investing in a tech hub model to support innovation, innovative products. And some estimates suggest that new startups account for 45 to 80% of new employment in Africa. There are also a few papers on Rwanda's innovation ecosystem. Those papers conclude a growing ICT sector and the number of ICT major university students and some challenges such as shortage of highly skilled engineers and limited access to finance. We conducted 31 face-to-face -face semi-structured interview with six categories of people, uh, 24 male and seven female and uh, 10 including 10 non-Rwandan people. Uh, six categories are government officers, entrepreneurs, faculty, university and college students, ICT engineers, and development aid organization staff. We used snowball sampling, and most of the interviews were held at K-Lab, an innovation hub in Kigali. Kigali. So I will begin with the strengths that we found. As I mentioned before, Rwanda's leadership is very focused on ICT, but we found that aspiration is not limited to just the leadership. It is widely and deeply shared. All of our participants wanted to see the ICT sector grow and appreciate, they appreciate the strong leadership from the Rwandan government. As a result, some things happened very quickly. One, aid organization employee said, I am amazed how quickly things can move here. Like if the president says, we want to do the wrong, they just have startups here doing the wrongs. Go to the right side. Uh, Rwanda is also already recognized as an ICT leader within Sub-Saharan Africa. They host many regional conferences and they have headquarters for ICT in Africa such as Smart Africa. One of their advantages 
is that Rwanda is one of just three African countries that has both English and French as national language. Next, uh, starting a business is also easy in Rwanda. Participants commented that people can start a company in only six hours. There is also support for public innovation hubs such as Caleb, uh, which has built a strong entrepreneurial community. A student entrepreneur who studied in other African countries said, it takes you like almost four months in a country X to register to do all those of things that you want to do. But in Rwanda, it's just one day. One another strength that stood out in the interview was a strong desire to contribute to Rwandan society. As an example, one student said, what will determine that I am rich? It is a time when my young brother will come to me having a problem and I will be able to solve that problem. That's the thing that will determine I am rich. This kind of statement was expressed consistently by Rwandan participants. There are a number of challenges that Rwanda's ICT sector faces in related work, such as lack of easy financing, collaboration with the agriculture sector, but we also found previously unreported findings. Participants from a range of sectors noted that Rwanda's public universities were not turning out employment-ready graduates. One reason that was pointed out is lack of practical training. As a result, jobless new graduates were reported. An engineer said, the teacher is there, he's teaching, everyone is writing something individually, and then everybody leaves. There are some level, but none of them include practical training. At the same time, uh, some participants noted the limited opportunity in ICT for training in ICT companies. And an aid organization employee said, private companies are not willing to offer them job opportunity at the entry level. I think that's the biggest challenge. Another participant said, some people became entrepreneurs because they couldn't find a regular job. Many of our participants mentioned challenges within the prevailing culture of entrepreneurship in Rwanda. Before I mention this point, I want to clarify that they are not essentialist comments about Rwandans, uh, Rwandan entrepreneurs. They are they are participants' report of what need to change and which we believe could change. One such, one such point was about a fear of failure. One successful entrepreneur said, Rwandan are very, very afraid to fail because they see failure as something bad. They don't see failure as lesson. They see failure as final. Another participant speculated that it might be because Rwanda see their public officers fired routinely for failing at their goal, so that they become averse to risk. Another point is reluctance to collaborate. Some participants mentioned that entrepreneurs hesitate to collaborate with other people. A government officer said the following about the time when he connected a financial company with an e-commerce company. The financial firm had online payments, but they didn't have customers. The e-commerce firm had online business, but they don't have payment. I was like, why? Why don't you communicate with each other? Now, the financial firm got five customers because of a small meeting that I held. Overall, we confirmed that Rwandan government energetic commitment to ICT-led national development, and we also found that aspiration is deeply shared by a range of people involved in ICT sector. This has been the case for 20 years or so, so why haven't we seen a rise of Rwanda's ICT sector, like, for example, that of India's? 
if you look at strengths and weaknesses, uh, we found a higher level. Uh, we reached two overall conclusions. The first is that Rwanda has made it easy to start business. It remains very difficult to continue or succeed in business. All of the weaknesses we found were challenges once a business was, was running. Second, Rwanda has done what it can address to address short-term obstacle to ICT entrepreneurship, but it is hampered by a barrier that require longer-term investment and attention. Setting a big goal, building a tech hub, making it easy to start companies, these are relatively easy things to change, but ensuring quality higher education or developing a strong culture of entrepreneurship, this takes time. Given that, we believe Rwanda needs to continue to do what it's already doing, strengthening universities, encouraging entrepreneurs, maintaining its aspiration, and to commit to these things for a longer term. But we also feel that there are short, some short-term efforts that could help. So we have three policy recommendations. The first is to support existing companies through non-technical training, more opportunity for financing and networking events. The second is making university education more practical by, for example, uh, by encouraging internship program with local companies. The third is promoting international exposure. Changing the culture of entrepreneurship may require some brains, more brain circulation. So providing opportunity for students and IT workers to spend time abroad will benefit Rwanda. To summarize, first, Rwanda's aspiration for ICT-led growth and national development was widely shared. Second, but while Rwanda make it easy to start business, it's difficult to succeed with them. Many short-term obstacles have been addressed, but longer-term challenges remain. Third, policy recommendations include practical university education, promoting international exposure, and supporting existing companies. Thank you for listening. Uh, if you have any comment or question, you can type in chat box, then I can easily find out. Thank you very much. All right, great. Thanks, Yoshi. Um, does anybody have questions? Um, I actually have a couple questions. So uh, your policy recommendations are to kind of continue on this path, but, but I mean, they've been working on this for 20 plus years. Um, how does that, how do you reconcile that? I mean, should they, you, you really think they should keep going down this path? Because, you know, entrepreneurship and especially doing this startup culture or ICT based entrepreneurship is really hard, right? I mean, even in the US. Um, and if you look at places like Singapore, I mean, while there is this uh, kind of colonial um, shadow of allowing uh, you know companies to come into your country and, and you know do things that way, uh, at least you're you know benefiting from you know, existing skill sets and um, they know how to at least do things right. So, um, could you comment on that? Yes. So, like I say, for example, uh, entrepreneurship support. Uh, I will not say Rwanda have to shift from like an entrepreneur starting to continuing. I think it should be both. But uh, so far, I feel Rwanda government successfully make a good system to have uh, startup companies. That is very great. On the other hand, uh, something may be missing for like, supporting uh, existing companies. So I heard some uh, participants said, uh, yeah, actually, it's been super easy to start a company here, but uh, after that, like, uh, support is good, not good enough, or uh, I don't know how to make, a, like, a financing or, like, accounts. Is, I don't know what, what to do. So I think uh, it's better to both of them, but to slightly shift, not only starting, but also continuing. That's my observation. Okay, thank you. Um, so Richard has a question. Uh, do you want to ask it or should I read it? 
Um, sure, I can go ahead and ask it. Um, I just flip on my camera here. So, thanks, Oshi. I'm just going to read it out. Um, this question may be a little bit outside the scope of the study, but I am curious about this. So, in your work, did you get a sense of the degree to which Rwanda's governmental relationships with foreign governments, like, for instance, the US or China, influenced the environment of the ICT development ecosystem? Yes, thank you for the question. Uh, of course, yes. So, uh, Rwandan government will try to make a ICT innovation ecosystem, but uh, actually domestic market is very small. So they need many collaboration with other countries. So actually, I okay, I didn't mention in detail, but uh, there is one problem about uh, getting finance for startup. And actually, uh, Rwandan ICT Chamber or Ministry of ICT are trying to get, try to invite a foreign investor holding many, like a pitch event or something. So, yeah, I think it's very important to like collaborate or doing some business with foreign government or companies, I'm not sure. Yeah, that's my observation. Uh, we have another question from Jonathan. Do you want to ask or? Uh, sure. Just, uh, you know, I, I guess my question is about the access to finance question and whether, you know, kind of embedded in that sort of simple thing of access to finances, you know, what kind of finance to what ends and is there enough of it? And if in particular, this is some stuff I've bumped into elsewhere in, in um, talking to entrepreneurs in, in the region is that the sort of the Silicon Valley timetable and mindset and equity tables and everything don't align with the types of businesses that um, the entrepreneurs may want to create um, and that that expectations on alignment, you know, under alignment sets up some challenges. I'm wondering the extent to which you bumped into that. Uh, and then if you want to speak further about whether that's, you know, where that sits in the kind of development discourse and whether we're, we're growing the right types of hubs or not, I'd be, I'd be curious. Okay, so if I answer about uh, financing for startup, uh, okay, one point I heard from some participant was uh, like they are a little bit difficult to get funding or financing locally. So say for example, uh, there are many banks, of course, in Rwanda, but uh, most of them have a kind of assessment system based on non-technical industry. So they recognize IT industry is very, very risky. So they have to put very high interest rate. So it's not affordable for startup company to get finance. And uh, uh, yeah, so that's why I'm not sure whether it's the connection between Silicon Valley type and Rwandan type, but uh, I found that's one of the uh, problem that they have. Kentaro, do you have any point to be added? Sorry, just unmuting. Um, you know, I would say that, uh, you know, one thing about Rwanda that I think is interesting in this context is that, you know, even though it might primarily be coming from the person of Paul Kagame, this aspiration for ICT is really coming from within the country. And at this point, it appears to be very widely shared, at least among, you know, people who are in a class where they could be a part of the, that um, economy. Um, and so in some ways, I would say that, you know, the foreign aid that's coming in is, is, you know, kind of happy to see this aspiration and then supporting it rather than imposing it from the outside. And in that respect, I think it's a relatively unique context. Uh, I actually have a question following up on that. Just um, to, to what extent do you think is that, uh, you know, this aspiration that's been, I don't know, uh, passed on, right? Like, you know, there's a promise of ICTs for, you know, making everybody's lives better, right? So, I mean, this, this idea that it's coming from inside, uh, uh, I mean, do you feel that, that there's a bit of a contradiction there? Uh, and what do you mean by the, con what's the contradiction? Well, I just mean that, um, you know, it's not, uh, 
if you ask somebody like, uh, you know, what are your aspirations? And they, and they say that, um, you know, I want to, to you know, do this entrepreneurship and I'm interested in ICTs. And I mean, it, is that sufficient to say that that is something that they want or um, could it be that they've been, you know, as they were growing up, there was all this, you know, government aid and international aid to say that, you know, ICTs are going to change our country and improve our futures. And then they sort of bought into that. Um, so in the paper, there's lots of, you know, quotes. It's less about individuals necessarily saying that they, you know, that they personally aspire to an IT job, but they, there is a widespread sharing of this idea that they would like to see the country grow. And quite a few people appear to have really bought into the idea that growing an ICT industry is the way to do it. And I would say, um, you know, this wasn't mentioned so much in the paper, but it's, it's very clear that people are agreed that it's the industry they want to grow, not like specific ICT, you know, for D type interventions, although some of that is also uh, there within individual entrepreneurs. All right, um, thanks. Uh, there's uh, actually two other questions. Um, so Anthony first and then Indrani. Um, sure, uh, thanks for the presentation. I think this actually is a little bit already addressed, but uh, basically the question I, I have is, um, uh, I, a lot of the, the aspects of entrepreneurship are not really, you know, uh, specific to ICT tech type, tech type startups. Um, and a lot of these industries in these regions, at least from my personal experience is, is not necessarily, uh, like they're not like huge ICT industries. Um, how do you, how might your findings also translate to other types of industries uh, in terms of building up the, you know, uh, industries, local, locally based industries in, in I don't know, um, uh, service, cellular services, uh, agriculture, things like that, I don't know. Okay, so I think it may not direct answer to your question, but uh, uh, of course there are many industries in Rwanda, but uh, one is uh, their main industry is agriculture, and they have to they want to change to more like a value-added industry. And uh, one problem I heard from some government officer is a uh, number of jobs is limited in Rwanda. And uh, they expect ICT industry to be the sector. So if we do a service industry or manufacturing industry, the number of jobs maybe can, we can guess. But uh, if they have a very big, good ICT company, then the like a number of laborers, maybe like a very huge, can be huge. So that's one point I heard they expect for ICT sector. That, does that answer your question? Um. Not quite. I mean, the oh. question is really about how does, how does entre your findings about entrepreneurship potentially extend to these other industries? Uh, of course, they need to, okay. So, okay. So for example, uh, when I go to k -Lab, that's the innovation hub in Kigali, all of them are kind of entrepreneur, but uh, I had what challenges is very, it's closed community. And uh, many people said uh, they didn't collaborate a lot with other industry. So that's one of the suggestions other sector people made. Uh, there are engineers or entrepreneurs in Innovation Hub. So they have to collaborate more with like a tourist touring industry and the uh, agriculture industry. And they have huge gap about like a ICT knowledge or literacy. And uh, yeah, that's uh, one of the challenge and the government want to make a kind of networking event or collaboration, but it's still very small. That my yeah, impression. Mm, sure, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I was just wondering about the role of, uh, you know, co-working spaces with respect to like support of new startups, new entrepreneurs. So India, for example, has uh, an increasing number of such spaces where there's like a large building and lots of startups housed together. And uh, so I was wondering if you like saw such spaces in Rwanda, because at least from what I hear, there seems to be like a different kind of like new energy in these spaces. I don't know how much 
collaboration happens across startups within these spaces, but I was just curious, like what you think uh, about the role of such spaces and if you see, saw something like this in one. Okay, thank you. So, okay, uh, K-Lab is a, okay, one of the place for everyone. So the people coming from very many like uh, types of people, like a, a high school student or university student or just new entrepreneur or like a small uh, com 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 company holder. So one, and they try to hold many like a networking event or presentation. That's one point they want to do. And another point is a kind of mentorship. Like a, a, after graduate from K-Lab, uh, those people uh, become uh, mentors and uh, uh, K-Lab connects those mentors and uh, young people and try to collaborate or advise. And uh, that's the main function of K-Lab. And uh, another feature is uh, K-Lab is a public innovation hub. And uh, that is the only one public innovation hub in Rwanda. So it's a uh, free of charge. So some people may just come for like free internet access or just meet people. So yeah, I can say the purpose is very wide range, diverse. Okay, um, thanks Yoshi. 